You're going to show the world huh, what God could do if he get a hold of your gifts and your talents and your DNA and your lineage. Because listen, your mama might have messed that up and your daddy might have messed that up and your grandpa might have messed that up and your grandma might have messed that up and your sister might have messed that up and your brother might have messed that up. But we stand here today saying we ain't messing up nothing. We're going to let God take control of this. And so we're going to go in, amen, and, and talk about this holiday that's coming up, amen. They've celebrated theirs, and we're about to celebrate ours. Anybody hear me up in here, amen? <laughs> so we're about to get it in, amen. And so if you can, turn with me to Esther chapter 1. I'm going to read a few verses, amen, uh, while, we, while we continue to worship with that melody in the background. And, and uh, I'm just going to read to kind of get us into it, and, and then we're going to get started. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Esther 1 and 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces, that in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Medea, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and four score days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace where were white, green, blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black and marble. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse from one another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law, none did compel, for so the king had appointed to all of his officers' house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also, Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to the king Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded uh, Mahuman and Bistha and Harbona and Bictha and Abacut, uh, 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 ab, uh, oh goodness, how are we going to say that, y'all? Abagut, Abagatha. Yeah, we're going to call her Baggin. We go, he ain't Baggin. And Zithar and, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to show the people, the princess, her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew the law and the judgment. And next unto him was Karshina, Shethar, uh, Admatha, uh, Tarshmish, Merez, Marcina, and Memucan, well, I'm messing up their names. The seven princes of Persia and Medea, which saw the king's face. They say in 15, what shall we do unto Queen Vashti according to the law? Because she had performed not the commandment of King Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. Father, bless your word. Even the mispronunciations, keep us and bless your word, God. And fill us up with your spirit tonight. For you are worthy to be praised. And we just thank you for it and give you the glory. In Yahshua, Jesus' name, we pray, God. In Jesus' name, because you are worthy to be praised. Come on, give God some praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo. My God, my God, my God. All right. All right. All right. 
Hallelujah. How y'all like that? Y'all like that extra time to just press in? Huh? Hallelujah. Glory to God. So y'all, in honor of Purim that's coming up in about two weeks, amen, um, um, I'm going to be going through, amen, a study on the book of Esther. And we're going to culminate on that Wednesday, amen, which is probably like about the 16th of March. We'll have a culmination of that study, amen, on the book of Esther. And um, the book of Esther uh, was written while our people was in captivity, amen, specifically after the Babylonian captivity uh, with Nebuchadnezzar, all right? Uh, Babylon fell to the Persian Empire, and so it went from Babylon to Persia, all right? And this letter was written around 460 B.C., um, according to the years of the Gentiles, 460 B.C. This is after the first and second kings in our Bible, after David, after Solomon, after all of the kings, huh? It's even after all of the prophets, Nehemiah, uh, or, or, or rather, no, it's after the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, all the major prophets. Now, it is, it is after all of that, but it's before Nehemiah and Ezra. That's when the book of Esther takes place. Now, the book of Esther is all about Purim, y'all. Um, it appears that the purpose, Deacon Carl, of this book is to explain, amen, Purim. It's like somebody, like a little kid, ran up to somebody and said, why are we celebrating this? Huh? And an adult, by the power of God, wrote the book of Esther as a history as to why we celebrate Purim. And so the whole book about is about Purim. Now, one thing that I need you to remember to be a specialist on the book of Esther is that the book of Esther is unique, uh, different than all the other books in the Bible. In this one way, it never mentions God, not a single time. His name is never mentioned. Not even any of his, the, the, the derivations of his name. He's not mentioned at all, all right? But how many people know that God could not be mentioned and still be all over the place? Anybody hear me up in here? All right? So he's not mentioned at all in the book. And to be honest with you, Esther is the most secular book in the Bible, all right? The most secular book in the Bible uh, because it's, it's, it's like the, the writer deliberately left God out because there's some places in that where he or she could have mentioned God, all right? But they deliberately left God out as though somebody had commanded them not to put God in it, all right? But sometimes when you intentionally leave someone out, huh, who is obviously the real star of the show, all right, when you intentionally leave them out, huh, you in fact only cause more attention to be pointed towards them. Anybody hear me up in here? And so when we study the book of Esther from a literary perspective, we see that the author, the writer, because God is the author, the writer uses a, an extremely brilliant literary device. By not mentioning God, we are forced to not see his face, but we are forced to see his hand all over the book. And we think about God more in Esther where he's not even mentioned in some of the other books. It's an amazing literary device. Huh? Hallelujah. So... We will cover the book of Esther in the next three Tuesdays, God spare. And uh, tonight we'll cover chapters one and two. We'll just kind of go through it. And uh, for some of you, amen, it's going to be your first time hearing the book of Esther taught. And I'm, I'm happy to be that. I'm happy. I'm privileged to, to do that for you. Amen. And we're going to do the best we can with the time allotted. For others, amen, you've been in the faith. You've been through the book. You've read the book yourself. Amen. And so this is not a, a, logo, a new logos word for you. Amen. But I want you to focus on a rainbow word in the book of Esther. All right. You've heard the story before, but this is not like watching a movie you've already watched. This is the living word of God. 
So even though you read this Bible a thousand times, when God need to tell you something out of it, he going to use an old story to give you a new revelation. Anybody hear me up in here? All right. And so for our older saints, that's how I want you to be listening. Be listening for the voice of Almighty God. Be listening for a rhema word. Somebody say, Lord, Lord give, me give me a rhema word. In Jesus' name. Come on, give him praise up in here. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, so let's begin with our first point. Our first point is just simply chapter 1, Vashti. Chapter 1, Vashti. All right? So in chapter 1, we are introduced to Ahasuerus, the king. All right? He's the king of Persia. Somebody say Persia. Persia. All right? Uh, uh, he's the son of one of the greatest kings of Persia, uh, a king by the name of Darius, all right? And Darius is mentioned in the book of Daniel. Uh, Darius, amen, is, is one of the kings that went through all the things with Daniel, the lion's den and all this other stuff. And so uh, uh, Darius is, is, is an awesome king and, and uh, knows the Hebrew people. And so Ahasuerus is Dan, uh, Darius' son. Well, Ahasuerus was showing his kingdom off to his princes, and the who's who of Persia, all right? His kingdom was so vast that it took him 180 days to show everybody anything, everything. You know what I'm saying? We go to my house, we could do it in five minutes, yo. You understand? We walk you here, we walk you there. This dude empire was so big because we know it was large because it went from India to Ethiopia. All right. He, he had he had he had black folk, uh, uh, both uh, the Gentile blacks and the Hebrew blacks. He, he had Europeans. He had he had Indians. He had Asians. He had them all, man. It, it, it was a major kingdom empire of the world. And so it took him one hundred and eighty days, a half a year to see all the glory and the riches of his kingdom. Huh? Huh? Somebody say, Lord, Lord. make my wealth. Stretch. Stretch. So, people so people have to take, have to take more, than more than one day to look at it look at in it. Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. Woo, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, you got to pass around. You got to drive around. All right, all right. So, so, so he's having this, this, this 180-day marathon, all right? And afterwards, he has a feast, okay? And the feast lasts for seven days, Miss Leola, and, and it's a lavish part of this feast, seven days long, and they drinking out of gold and, and silver, and it's nothing but the best. It's nothing, it's, it's, it's expensive, all right? And so while uh, Ahasuerus is having the fellas, a God, with a feast uh, with him, uh, his queen, Vashti, is having a feast with all the ladies in another place, another part of the royal estate. Well, Ahasuerus was drinking, and it wasn't Kool-Aid he was drinking, y'all, all right? And he got a little toasty, all right? Somebody say toasty. Yes, he got a little toasty. And in verse 11, he tells his servants, he says, listen, bring the queen, Vashti, and put the royal crown upon her head, all right? And some commentators say that they had saw all of his estate, all of his treasures, all of his blessings, and King Ahasuerus said, yeah, you done seen all of that, but you ain't seen the best yet. So he go to get the queen, all right? And he told him, he told him put the crown on her head. And you know she wasn't going to be dressed with nothing bad, eh, God, nothing raggedy with the crown on her head. So she was coming clean. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? So he said, listen, I'm going to show you all the best thing that I got, all right? Go get the queen, all right? So, so the Bible tells us that Vashti was beautiful. All right. It says she was beautiful. And that's all it says. It was that she was beautiful. Now, this is important because we're going to look at something else. So it says that she was beautiful. All right. Uh, 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 uh. And in verse 11, go to 11 and 12. Let's just look at it. So he told him to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty. For she was fair to look upon. Verse 12. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment. By his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth. Well, y'all, when the king said, y'all go get Vashti and we'll show everybody how beautiful she, she is. Vashti say, I'm good. <laughs> they say, Vashti, no, the king said it. She said, I don't care who said it. I'm good. You know? 
And so she refused the king of Persia. Now his kingdom is from Ethiopia to India. And everybody listens to him. And if you know anything about the Babylonian and the Persian empires, them people didn't play. If you didn't listen, that's why they had the lions then. That's why they had the fiery furnace. And so everybody listened, but Vashti didn't listen. All right? And God gave me a revelation right here. And God showed me something to tell you tonight. When the king calls you up, don't you ever miss your opportunity. Don't you ever miss your opportunity. All right? And this first applies to God, y'all, because he's the king of kings. And there's going to be some times in your life where God calls you up. All right? Because promotion don't come from the east or from the west. From the north or from the south, promotion comes from the Lord. And in our lives, sometimes, Miss Denise, God wants to promote us. And the revelation is when the king calls you up, don't you ever miss your opportunity. All right? Looking at somebody else and what somebody else got going on. Don't you worry about nobody else when the king calling you. You see? And we're going to talk about what Vash, Vashti probably had in her mind. But, but not only God, all right? Because God ordains and appoints power in our lives, all right? Because the powers that be are ordained by God. And just because God himself didn't cause the sky to be black and say, Misha, I need you to come up. But sometimes he can speak through somebody else. A power that's been ordained by him, but nonetheless, it is God, all right? And so in this situation, you have people in your life. Maybe it's your husband, huh, who's ordained a power in your life. When your husband calls you up, don't you miss your opportunity. Maybe it's your parents, young person, huh? That's an authority in your life. When your parents call you up, huh, a promotion, a better position, a higher rank, huh, to be used by God in a greater way. Oh, I'm losing my bracelet, but that's all right. We preaching up in here now. So, so, so when they call you up, young person, huh, don't miss your opportunity. When your teachers in the classroom call you up, don't miss your opportunity. When your boss at work call you up, want to promote you and bless you, don't you miss your opportunity, huh? When the political leaders in our city, in our state, in our nation, in our people, call you up. Don't you miss your opportunity. Amen. And oh yeah, y'all can give some God glory for that. Come on, give God some glory for that. Huh? When your church leadership call you up, whether it's your pastor, your first lady, your ministers, your deacons, and say, come up. God has more for you. You may have to let go some things, huh? But God want more of you. When God call you up, don't you ever miss your opportunity. Come on, give y'all some praise up in this place. And so here we are, y'all. Huh? Because in life, let me tell you, we often miss golden opportunities, y'all. If we can look back over our lives, y'all, you don't have to be old to even think about it. You could still be in your teens and look at some God-given opportunities that you done passed up. God forbid you in your 20s, your 30s. Whew, when you get to my age, the 40s, you look back and you say, oh, God, what I could have done. You know, 50s, 60s. Huh? Well, Pastor, why do we miss our opportunities? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you a few reasons why we miss them. And some of these reasons might be why Vashti miss hers. Huh? Number one is fear, huh? Fear. You'd be scared. And Vashti might have been a person, she don't like audiences. She don't like people. <laughs> she don't like to walk in front of people. When she walking, she beautiful, but when she walking, she thinking about what everybody thinking about her. And what they really thinking is, she beautiful. <laughs> but she's so self-conscious, so full of the fear of man that she thinking that they talking about her. That they can see her faults. And so because of fear, she don't want to go up. Because of fear, she don't want to go up when the king called her. Who am I preaching to today? Here we make a call that the worship team singing. And, and, and how do that fear will grip you? And you I don't want to go up. The king is calling you up. 
We're telling you we teach in Sunday schools now. And we open it up for teachers now. Oh, but I don't want to stand in front of people. But the king is calling you up. You know what I'm saying? We're telling you we need security. But they have to sit in the front like TP. And all the people look at them. So what? The king is calling you up. You see? Yeah, they're going to look at you. But you don't have to look back at them. You see? The fear of man working a snare and a snare is a trap to hold you back from where God wants you to be. When the king calls you up, don't miss your opportunity. Listen, the greatest things that I've done in my life have been when I've overcome fear in my own heart. When that fear is holding me back, don't do it. When I'm nervous and my knees shaking and, and, and I look, my, my mouth is dry and I'm, I'm like, oh God. But when I overcome it through the power and the grace of God, I'm like, look what the Lord had done. God, you're amazing. Huh? It's not only fear, saints, but also hallelujah. Oh, God, come on now. It's a bunch of things in our lives that will stop us. Hallelujah. Let me stick to my little notes. Confusion in your life will stop you from coming up when the king calls you. You got too much going on. Your life is out of order. So whenever we need you, the king needs you, hey, God, you can't make it because all the devil got to do is push one of your many buttons. You see? It's too much confusion. You got to get your life in order, your kids in order, your marriage in order, your finances in order. Got to get your health in order, your body in order. The king is calling us up with his confusion. And I see Vash and they're talking to her guns and they fussing up and they're cutting up and the king calling them up and she not worried about the king because she's talking with all this confusion, all this mess, all this gossip. Listen to me. It's going to come a certain point in your life where you're going to say, God, this confusion is not worth it. I'm letting it go so I can go up with you in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. In the spirit I'm hearing, your family has got a lot of confusion in it. And you can't be what God needs you to be because you're so connected by blood instead of connected to him by spirit. Anybody hear me up in here? Too much confusion. Don't you know that God speaks in a still, small voice? And when there's confusion, you can't hear that voice. It's too still. It's too small. It's too quiet. Huh? Why we miss our opportunities? A lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. When you don't know your purpose, when you don't know where you're going, when you don't have a plan, God opens a door before you, huh? And if you don't know your purpose matches up with that opportunity, this is your life work right here. This is going to change your life, your, your spouse's life, your children's life, because you have a lack of knowledge of God and who you are and who he created you to be. This door that's been open for you, you put your hand in your pocket and you walk on by. You miss your opportunities because of a lack of knowledge. You got to know yourself. You got to know your God. You got to know your gifts. You got to know why you were created. And the best way to do that is to press into Christ because our life is hid in Christos, is hid in Christ. The more you know of him, the more you're going to know of yourself because he's going to teach you about yourself. Huh? When you got a problem with something that you bought, huh? You don't go to the dude on the corner to ask what's going on. You call the manufacturer. You call the one who created it. You go back to the owner's manual. Well, you have an owner's manual because you have a creator, somebody who manufactured you. If you want to know how you work, you go to the one who created you. Come on, give y'all some praise, huh? A lack of knowledge. Not only a lack of knowledge, a lack of vision. Huh? Or stop you. From seizing upon the opportunities. Maybe Vashti had a lack of vision. When you have a lack of vision, you see the opportunity, huh? But you can't see what the moment means, huh? Because sometimes opportunities on the surface look smaller than what they really going to end up being. I imagine all the people that started with us at Philadelphia Christian Church that jumped off the boat when we might have been just a Bible study, when we was up in there on Pine Street in our stage. I guess our stage was this high, huh, Heaven? <laughs> Hallelujah. You could slip and not even fall off that thing. You just slip off and just, you know what I'm saying? Huh? 
our molding, our sheetrock was bust. Hey, God, I don't even want to tell you all the stuff that was wrong with the building. Unless I still get in trouble with building and codes to this day. You see? You see? But a lot of people left. A lot of people say, it's ministry not for me. But the reason was, is because they didn't have vision. You see, vision, with vision, you could look at a thing now and see it down the road. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? When you don't have vision, God will bring you an opportunity. Huh? It's almost like an old house or an old car. But you can't see that it's got good bones. You can't see that under this ugly purple and mustard paint. Huh? It's a house with good bones, with a good floor plan. With, 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 with sturdy, a hey God, two by fours and, and, and something that, that people would pay, hallelujah, top dollar for. You see, but without a vision, the people perish. And so sometimes we miss our opportunity for a lack of vision. Somebody say, God, give me vision in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, give God some glory up in this place. Missing opportunities. I'm telling you, because listen, we got a lot of women in here. Y'all miss a lot of good men because y'all ain't got vision. And we got a lot of good women that miss a lot of good, good, wait, 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 let me, let me try. <laughs> got a lot of good men that miss a lot of good women because they don't have vision. Baby, don't judge me for what it looked like now. God ain't done with me yet. Anybody hear me up in here? Woo! Come on, somebody. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's move on before I start dancing up in here. A lack of faith. You'll miss your opportunity. You look at it and you say, I can't do it. They call you up for a promotion. You want you to be a supervisor. I just can't. I, I, listen, man. If God brought you to it, he's going to bring you through it. You hear what I'm saying? If he's going to call you, he's going to equip you. Don't you miss an opportunity for a lack of faith. I would rather try and fail than not try at all. I'll be up in there faking it till I make it. You understand what I'm saying? I'll be up in there. You hear me, Josh? I'll be oh, yes, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. But learning as I go. Oh, yes. By the time they're done with me, maybe I'll be a specialist up in here. I'll walk around telling people what to do. Oh, sir, that's a mistake right there. They're looking at me, boy, you ain't knew nothing when you came in. But it's not how you start. It's how you finish that comment. A lack of faith, huh? Sometimes sin will stop us from seizing an opportunity. God will open a door, but we won't go through the door because we bound. We got this drug problem, this drinking problem, this problem running the women, this problem running the men, this problem these days running the women and the men. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Problems. Problems with sin will stop you from seizing opportunities. And let me tell you, there's no sin good enough for you to pass up God's purpose for your life. I'm telling you right now, man, there's no sin good enough. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. And especially the sin of envy and the sin of jealousy will make you miss your opportunities. Because while God has a door open for you, you looking at the next man's door, or the next woman's opportunity. Like they say in the streets, boo, you got to stay in your lane. You got to mind your business. You got to run your race. You understand what I'm saying? Stop trying to get by my open door. You better sweep around your own front door. You understand what I'm saying? So because of envy and jealousy, people have an open door before them, but they're looking at what you have. They're over here with you, and it's, that's not for them. That's not for them. Your opportunity, your calling, your grace, your favor, your house, your car, your wife, everything that God done bless you with, your children, your husband, everything that God done bless you with is for you. And what God has for you is for you and it's not for them. So here they are playing around with you, missing what God have for them. And I just want to tell you in the spirit, some of y'all worried about some other people's blessings missing yours while your blessings are actually bigger than the ones you worried about over here. Oh, I got to say that again. Y'all ain't clapping up. Y'all ain't clapping up. 
Because you're worried about somebody's small blessings, but your purpose is bigger. Yeah, 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 yeah. So sin will keep you from, from, from seizing the opportunities. Satan will keep you from seizing the opportunities. He will. He will deceive you. He will deceive you. When God wants you to go right, he will deceive you to go left. And listen, I don't see many people, y'all, many years of pastoring, practicing law, you understand what I'm saying, and just living life. I've seen so many people deceived by the enemy of our souls, y'all, to leave a place, to go somewhere, to leave a job, to leave a spouse, to leave a family, to just to leave an open door of blessing. Huh? For, 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 for just deception. Just Satan. That old serpent. The dragon. You see? Adam and Eve had an opportunity in that garden. And they lost that opportunity for a serpent. Had God said? And God only trying to hold you down. God, God don't want you to be blessed. God, God knows if you eat, you're going to be like him. And God don't want you to be like him. When all our God wants is us to be like him. Adam and Eve, you was already like him. For you were created in his image. You, you already had it. It was already yours. But you left the opportunity. You left the open door. Because you was deceived. Don't be deceived tonight. Don't be deceived tonight. Find your purpose. Wait on your God. And don't miss your opportunities. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. Woo! We on it tonight. Come on here. Okay, so Vashti, Vashti doesn't show up. The king and his servants see this, and the king is offended, y'all. And so the king called all the men in the kingdom, and they have like a, a meeting, all the, all the, all the nobles and, the, and, and, and his helpers, his servants, his chamberlains, they have a meeting. And they tell the king, they say, king, listen, Vashti just didn't offend you. She offended all of us. Because if the, if the king's wife don't listen to him, in the world, we're going to go home and our wives going to listen to us. All right? And so that's what they say. They say Vashti was going to cause trouble and havoc in the whole kingdom. So long story short, Vashti was removed as queen, y'all, because she missed her opportunity. And she didn't know how to wear her position. You see? That's chapter one. Let's move to chapter two. All right? All right, it's all right, Misha. Misha, you say that boy ain't getting a chapter two. Yes, I got the chapter two, Misha. Yeah. Hallelujah. Chapter two. All right, chapter two is this. Mordecai, Esther, and a contest. Okay, we're going to talk about that for a little bit. Huh? We're going to talk about that for a little bit. All right? All right? So in chapter two, uh, they go about trying to get a hazardous another queen, Brother Carl. All right? So they come up with a contest. A, a, a beauty pageant of sorts. So they bring before the king all the single women of the kingdom in chapter 2. Huh? This is what's going on. Uh, it's kind of like a beauty pageant mixed up with the bachelor. All right? <laughs> okay? And the king has to pick which one he wants. And I believe that the bachelor, all the bachelor did was copy the book of Esther. That's all they did. That's all they did. So, 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 so the king gets to pick who he, who he wants. Now, in verse 5, look at verse 5 of chapter 2 with me. We introduced to a man by the name of Mordecai. Somebody say Mordecai. Mordecai. All right. Now, in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Hebrew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. All right. Now, these names should seem so familiar to you. All right. Because when we talk about Shimei, when we talk about Kish, and when we talk about Benjamin, huh, this is no other family than the family of King Saul. All right? But this is later on down the road. This is later on down the road. Huh? This is King Saul's family. Well, pastor, what's the revelation in this? Mordecai is from a family of missed 
opportunities. Are you hearing me up in here? I'm talking about a whole family, y'all. King Saul has the opportunity of being the first king of God's people. All right? He had all of the attributes and accoutrements. Everybody was listening to him. He was the tallest man. He was handsome. Everything was good. God gave him all the graces to subdue the people under him. He was going to be the king, y'all. And I understand the Messiah was always predestined to come from Judah, but I just want to just speculate and entertain, if you can entertain me for a second, if he would have done good and did everything he was supposed to be, we could have been calling Jesus, huh, the son of Saul instead of the son of David. What a magnificent opportunity. A magnificent opportunity to be the king of God's people, but guess what? It was a missed opportunity. It was a blown opportunity. Because he couldn't obey the most high God. Sin kept him from being all that God had created him to be. But not only him, his son Jonathan. When we think about Jonathan, his name means a gift. He was a breath of fresh air. And Jonathan was great. And Jonathan had all kind of potential. And Jonathan was more righteous than his father. But the problem is he was still connected to his father. You see, sometimes it's not you that'll keep you from your opportunities. Sometimes it's the people that you love, people that you're connected with. Sometimes it's family. And Jonathan wound up not even fulfilling every single thing that he was supposed to fulfill. All of his awesome character, all of his, he could have been David's right hand. He said, David, you're going to be king and I'm going to be right there with you. But you know what happened? He died on the battlefield with his rebellious, stiff-necked, idolatry, a witch a seeking prophet. Uh, um, oh, goodness. I'm, I'm trying to pull everything out of the Bible. Tarot card reading daddy. That's who he died with. That's who he died with. That's who he died with. And Jonathan's potential gone. Missed opportunity. Not just Jonathan, but Ishbosheth, the son of Saul who took over after Saul died. Missed opportunity. Foolish. Foolish, wound up getting killed in his own kingdom, huh? What about uh, Michal that we read about? Saul's daughter, the one who talked about David dancing and praising and worshiping God, huh? She was a beautiful woman. All, all the tribe of Benjamin, they were just beautiful people, full of potential. How many people know people in Lafayette, in this area, they're beautiful people, full of potential, but they don't rise to that potential. Don't rise to that potential. You see them later and you're like, what happened to you? You see, y'all give me just a little more time. We moving quickly. You see? You see? Well, Mordecai comes from this family, y'all. That's his family. And that's why I think God give us those names, Jed, Shimmy. Kish, which was Saul's daddy, and Benjamin, which was Saul's tribe. God was telling us he was from a family of missed opportunities. You see? But the revelation God gave me is that, hallelujah, it doesn't matter what family you come from. Huh? Huh? Old songwriter say it's not where you're from, it's where you're at. <laughs> you understand what I'm telling you? Listen to me good. Now listen to me good. All right? All right? Just because all of your family blew their opportunities, I'm here to tell you tonight, it doesn't mean that you are going to blow yours. Anybody hear me up in here? That's what this is all about. That's why God put that right there. Huh? That's why he put that right there. You see, the rest of your family's actions does not define who you are. All right? All right? In fact, as you utilize your potential, with the grace of God and show the world what God can do through you, your family will not define you. But through God's grace, you will define the rest of your family. They're going to come up to you and say, oh, you such and such boy? No, they're going to go up to your daddy and say, you such and such daddy? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's how they're going to do that. Mordecai flipped the script. You see? You see, you're going to show the world, huh, what your family could have been. Amen. You're going to show the world, huh, what God could do if he get a hold 
of your gifts and your talents and your DNA and your lineage. Because listen, your mama might have messed that up and your daddy might have messed that up and your grandpa might have messed that up and your grandma might have messed that up and your sister might have messed that up and your brother might have messed that up. But we stand here today saying we ain't messing up nothing. We're going to let God take control of this. And we're going to let God pull out of our family genes, y'all. Huh? Every single good thing he put in there. And they're going to look at you, Kent, and they're going to look at your family, and they're going to say, you came from that? Other churches going to look at you, hallelujah, up here, and they're going to say, man, Pastor Omar using that boy. I wonder if he got a brother. They're going to bail your brother out of jail trying to make something out your brother. <laughs> That's how blessed you're going to be. That's how gifted you're going to be. He come from a family of missed opportunities, but he didn't let it stop him. You see? You see? Mordecai was from Saul's family. You see? But he was different from Saul. And what we need to understand is, is that he is about to take that, who he is, and he's about to pour all of that into a young lady by the name of Esther. You see? Let's talk about Esther. Don't get tired on me here, yo. Don't get tired. Listen, we're going to get through this. Hallelujah. Verse 7 of chapter 2. Look what it says. And he brought up Hadassah. Somebody say Hadassah. That's her Hebrew name. Hadassah. Isn't that beautiful? Hadassah. You see? Uh, that is Esther. They called her Esther, which means a star. Huh? His, and the Bible says it was his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, who Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. All right? This Hadassah, this Esther, is either, theologians disagree, Either his niece or his first cousin. We're going to go with the King James for tonight. We're going to say that that was his first cousin. That was his uncle's daughter. We're going to just follow that right there. All right? Esther's father and mother passed away. She was an orphan, y'all. Her father's name, we're going to learn later, was Abihel. A-B-I-H-A-I-L. Abihel. From the tribe of Benjamin. From the family of Saul. All right? They call that Mordecai's uncle. Verse 7 says that they was taken captive in Babylon, a family full of lost potential and missed opportunities. They living in a foreign land, but they got something special about Hadassah. All right? Something special about her. The Bible says in verse 7 that the maid was fair and beautiful. Normally, those two words, Angela, are the same thing. When you say, oh, yeah, she's fair. She fair. It, it, it's a fair view. So, so, so we're saying two things. But it, when we go back to the Hebrew, they're saying two different things. All right? All right? Now, I told you to pay attention to Vashti. Vashti was just beautiful. Hmm? But Hadassah was from a different bloodline. Ooh. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, mm, 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 mm. So I looked up, <laughs> Miss Leola, Minister Sam, I looked up that word fair, and it's 2R. Uh, it means to have an outline. <laughs> Go up and look up this word in the Greek. It means to have an outline. Now, I'm not saying where she was outlined at. I didn't, I didn't say the top or the bottom. I just say she was outlined. It means to have a, 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 a form. A figure. I'm telling y'all what the Bible says. That word means that Esther had a shape. It was something about that Hadassah. Esther walked through that and they said, say, <laughs> Hadassah. She had a shape. So this verse is really saying that Esther was both beautiful and she had a good outline. 
a good form, a good figure. My mother in law, you laugh? A lot of mother in law. She had, a, she had a good shape. That's what they're saying. You know? I, I, don't, I can't tell you what part of her shape was the best. But y'all use y'all imagination. You see, because some of the songwriters say there ain't nothing. Nothing in the world. I like more than a. Wait. Montgomery, don't you play like you don't know that song? Montgomery said, Pastor, I'm in church. I ain't singing that. But she had a shape, she had a form, huh? All right, all right. So Mordecai took Hadassah in when she was very young, y'all. And he raised her like his own. It was his niece. He raised her like his own. And everything that God had gave him to break that generational bondage from coming from a house of missed opportunities, he put it into her, all right? He put it into her, all right? Revelation. It doesn't have to be only your children that you pour into. Some of us, man, we just, we just, we just want to pour into our children. All right? And listen, you should pour into your children. But I don't think that somebody has to be biologically from you. For you to care about their lives and actually try to uh, uh, disciple them into doing great things. I'm speaking to our people right now and all of our people love us. Listen, this is a part that we need so bad right here. Because we're from a place with a lot of, hey God, single parent homes. We're we from a, a place where, where we, got, we got boys with no daddies and, 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 and mamas with, hey God. Uh, uh, Y'all hear what I'm saying? We need people to step up and take a mantle like Mordecai and say, I know that you're not for me, but you're still for me because you're of my people. And I'm going to take what God did in me and I'm going to put it, hallelujah, into you. I'm going to train you up. And some of our older saints, I want to talk with you. Even the ones on, on, on live stream right here, I need to talk with you because some of your kids might be grown and gone. Some of your kids, hey, God, you done raised them. They're doing great. Listen, your job is not done. You packing up your stuff like you're ready for God to take you. God not done with you yet. There's still some more children for you to disciple and raise up. Yes, there's still. And you don't have to know them. You don't have to be related to them. They ain't got to be your biology. No, but they're from Judah. They're from Israel. They're Hebrew. And even if they were Gentile, they're the people of God. And it's time for us to pour in. You see? Our older men need to do the same thing. You see? Each one got to reach one, y'all. And that's what Mordecai did. That's what we need so bad, y'all. And some of y'all, listen, you done blew it with your children. You done got saved late. No, them children grew up when you were still, look, you were still getting it. Listen, you couldn't teach them nothing but how to dance. You know what I'm saying? You couldn't teach them nothing but how to be in the club. And, and, and let me tell you something. You look back and you where you are now and you're like, God, if I could only go back. I got news for you. You can go back. Anybody hear me up in here? Because they still have some children of God coming up the ranks that you could pour into. Just a word. Just, a, just an encouragement. You done been through much, so much, made so many mistakes, hey, God. Hey, God, would make you an excellent teacher. You see? We even have some, hallelujah, still waiting on kids in here. And while you wait, huh, you got to work and get busy. You see? While you wait, go ahead and raise them, them some other people's children. You know, the Bible say, when you're faithful in that which is of another man, that's when God going to give you your own. Anybody hear me up in here? Hey, God, I'm telling you right now, man. I'm telling you. Prove your metal to God. Prove your love for God. Prove your love for his people. Pour into somebody who may not be your biological child. May the church hear what the Spirit is saying tonight. Come on, give y'all some praise. Amen. So quickly, listen, we wrapping up. Pastor, you already said that. No, but I'm serious. We're going to just do these. This, this. We, I'm just, I'm listening. I got a little part right here. I'm telling y'all, I got a little part. Here's a little part. So, so as the... Esther enters the contest. Huh? She has favor with the king's servant. I'm talking about automatically, y'all. You know, automatically. One of the commentators said, or oh, the Bible says, all that looked upon her gave her favor. All right? And 
And I want to tell you, huh? you know, God blessed Esther with good looks. It was him that did it. All right? It was part of her favor package. We all have a favor package. We all have something about ourselves that's going to get us favor with other people. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me up in here. I'm telling you, for Esther, it was looks. For you, it, probably, it, it could be looks, but it could be something else. It could be your wisdom. It could be, it could be your knowledge of different things. It could be, hey, God, the way you cook. It could be, listen, it could be anything. It could be the way you clean. Ain't nobody clean a toilet like you, but listen, you get favor. The people looking for you, they're they flagging you down downtown. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> we all have something about ourselves that get us favor. All right? What's your favor spot tonight? Do you know it? And if you know it, do you work it? Huh? Because if God favored you in an area, hallelujah, that favor, that gift is going to bring you before kings. And it's going to open doors for you. Do you know your favor spot? It could be something simple about it, like, like the way you dress. It don't matter. For Esther, it was the way she looked. All right? Now, here's another revelation. When you find your favor spot, work on other areas. Are you hearing me up here? You see, because Vashti was just beautiful. Esther was fine. I mean, uh, uh, she had an outline. I'm, hey, did I see that, baby? Esther, I really hurt my hand just now. I hit myself hard. It must have been the spirit. Esther had an outline. She was fair. She was beautiful. But watch this. She didn't stop with just her looks. We're going to find that they brought many beautiful women before the king. But Esther had something more than beauty. Once you find your favor spot where God favored you, you work on other areas in your life. You develop other areas in your life. I'm about to do a whole post where I talk about, hallelujah, investing yourself educationally, building yourself up learning different things. I could see Esther, we're going to get into it on that night with that king. She's talking about economics with the king. She's talking about politics with the king. She's talking about history with the king. She's talking about his family genealogy with the king. She's talking about the Bible with the king. She can go anywhere the king want her because she's been groomed. She's been poured into her. Baby, Esther is just not a looker. Anybody hear me up in here? Don't you sit in here and just rely on one area to get you by. Develop yourself. Invest in yourself. I can see Esther in there just, just by the spirit, just, just my imagination, the king up in there. He's royalty, y'all. He done been to the best schools. He come up in there. He speak in Persian. She speak Persian. She speak in Hebrew. He, he, he speak Hebrew. She speak Hebrew. Huh? Now, I'm just being facetious because German. Was, he, he speak German. She speak in German. Who can talk? Whatever. You know what I'm saying? Whatever, whatever he coming with, she coming with. Huh? But we got some believers in here, huh? You ain't investing in yourself. You're not building yourself up. You're not continually learning and growing. That's how you're going to maximize the open door, the opportunity that God has for you, you know? And y'all going to get more on that on that Facebook post. I ain't going to give y'all too much. I'm going to do it later. But somebody say, invest in myself. Come on, give God some praise up in here, huh? All right, we wind and done. Misha, I got a little piece. Look, it's right here. All right. The contest begins. The king falls in love with Esther. Head over heel. Now, it might have been that shape. <laughs> might have been that beauty. But I guarantee you, it was a lot more than that. You know? A conversation, a godliness. It's, just the total package, man. He could have had any woman from Ethiopia to India. He picked Hadassah, an orphan from a broken, misopportunity family huh? who became a queen. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. Huh? 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 So in this life, brothers, y'all come, come rescue me. Hallelujah. In this life, 
You you're you're either going to be a person with missed opportunities or seized moments. And I'm praying to God that we all be people that seize the moments that come along and actually handle our business for almighty God. I done kept you a little late because we worship, y'all. But I never like to leave without giving you an opportunity to make Yahshua your personal Lord and Savior. If there was any opportunity that was most important in all of humanity, it is this one. How dare we come in here and not open the doors of the spiritual church and give you an opportunity to make Yahshua your Lord and Savior. And I beg of you, don't be like Saul who ran away from God. Don't be like Jonathan who hung with the wrong people and got himself knocked off because he just couldn't cut some ties. You see? Don't be like Mikhail or Michelle, however y'all want to call her, who just couldn't get into the worship of God. You know? But if you hear there's an awesome opportunity for you to be saved, to be forgiven, to be in love with God and also to love God. To seize this opportunity, all you have to do is admit that you're a sinner. Believe in Yahshua Hamashiach as your Savior. Believe that he died on the cross, he was buried in the grave, and that he rose on the third day. And confess him as your Lord and Savior. I stand here today, man with a testimony of what God can do in the life of someone who surrenders. I got friends in prison. I got friends that's on the streets. People that I hung tight with, y'all. And there was no difference between me and them. But I just said yes to the opportunity to know Jesus as my Savior. I don't know who you are tonight. But we're going to pray. And you got to pray this thing with your heart and mean it. And you got to seize this opportunity. Somebody say, Most High God, I love you. And I only love you because you first loved me. I admit that I'm a sinner. But I believe that you died for sinners. And that you were buried for sinners. And that you rose from the grave for sinners. And I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Save me and wash me clean. Forgive me. Show me my purpose. Help me to seize all of my opportunities. Use me in these last days. And I promise I will worship you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give God some praise. Give him some praise. Thank y'all for staying late with me. Hallelujah. Love y'all. Be blessed. Be blessed.